We serve a great God. Man, what a powerful declaration. Powerful proclamation of praise that there's nothing he can't do. There's no mountain too high, no valley too low that he can't reach into and can't pull you out of. There's nothing that, that can stand in your way or in your path that if, that if he's called you to it, then he's going to bring you through it. And he's going to be with you through every step of the way. It's who he is. It's his nature. He's good. He's faithful. He's mighty. And he's worthy of every bit of praise that we could possibly give him. Praise God. Well, it's so good to be with you this morning. Good morning, everyone. That's here, everyone that's watching online as well. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Pastor Zach, and I'm going to be sharing the word with you this morning. Super, super excited about it. Uh, before we dive in, just have a couple of announcements. Uh, so young adults, we're going to be meeting this week, same time, same day, Tuesday, 6.30, but the venue is going to be different. So we're going to be having it at our place, at our house this week. So uh, Tuesday, 6.30. I want you to come to our place, be able to hang out. If you're between the ages of 18 and 30, that's our young adults group where we get together and just have community, open the Bible, study the Word of God, grow together. It's a really good time, so I invite you out to that. Um, the, the address will be on social media. It'll be on the website, um, or you can just come ask me for it, too. Uh, and then next Sunday is step two of our growth track. So if you're wanting to uh, know more about Stonebridge, become a part of Stonebridge Church. Um, step two of Growth Track is next Sunday, uh, January 22nd. There'll also be another option on February 5th, but that's going to be taking place right after the Sunday morning service in the fellowship hall. Uh, it'll be a two-hour class. We'll serve lunch and everything. Um, and that's really just laying the foundations of who we are. It's a deep dive into who we are as a church. And then uh, once you take that class, you have the ability to become a member. So really encourage you to, to do that. If you haven't yet filled out a Connect card, that's kind of the starting point. If you want to know more about us, uh, if you need prayer, if you want to just kind of find out what we're about as a church and get connected, first step is to do that. Fill out a Connect card. There's one that's right in the seat in front of you, or you can scan the QR code on the seats. Or you could go to the website and do that as well. And then also, just one last thing for today. Wondering if, if some guys can maybe stick around just for, I mean, depending on how many we have, it probably won't take too long. But we're just going to be taking this tree down. Um, so Nate's just looking for a little bit of, little bit of muscle. Ladies, too, if you want to help. Uh, more than welcome to. Jen's shaking her head. She's like, nah, we'll leave those to the guys. All right. Yeah, so just right after the service, we'll be taking this down. If you could stick around, it'd be great. All right, I'm excited to dive in. If you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Psalm 84 uh, just in preparation. But I want to just build a little bit of a foundation and on-ramp before we jump in. So two weeks ago, uh, New Year's Day, I preached a message the first Sunday of the year. And uh, I stated that, that we really believe as a leadership that this is going to be a, an amazing year. It's going to be a powerful year, not just because it's a new year, but we're really believing that there's going to be, in this year, leading up to it, there's been a lot of time spent on our knees, believing for breakthrough, believing God for things, spending time in, in intercession, and, and really seeking the face of God for, for what he wants to lead us into. And we believe that, that a lot of that breakthrough is going to happen this upcoming year. And uh, we believe it, uh, but it's not just going to happen. It's not just going to happen for no reason. It's, it's not just because we want it to happen or just because even we believe that it's going to happen. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to happen. And so what I had mentioned is that all of these things that we're believing for, it's going to hinge on what our response is in this next year. Each one of us and, and us collectively, what our response is going to be to God in this next year. And so our response in 2023 is going to be everything for us. And so there may be great things that God wants to do in you. There may be great things that God wants to do in your life. There may be great things that God wants to do through you to reach the world around you. But uh, he's waiting for the right response. God is waiting to the proper response from you is, is what he's looking for and what he's waiting for. Even when it comes to our salvation, when it comes to us coming to know him and believing and trusting in Jesus, 
when it comes to us recognizing our sin and acknowledging that, that we need a Savior and that Jesus was that perfect sacrifice who came and lived perfect life, died on the cross for our sin, and that through him alone, not, not ourselves, not our works or anything that we can do could save us, but it's through him that we receive eternal life, that we receive forgiveness, healing, life, all of that. That is even something that is, is a response from us. As God has given us that gift, and as he's prompted us with that, it's up to us to respond and to receive that, but then also to walk in the life that he's called us to. And so our response is everything. And so I, what I don't want is for us to miss out on anything because we miss the response. And so I think there's biblical evidence for this. Jesus, his miracles, his, his healings, his signs, wonders, all those things, they were a response to faith. It happens in the presence of faith. It's the result of the, the response of faith from people. There's no limitation on Jesus' power, but his purpose was to perform these miracles in the presence of faith. And so it, it's a response. In this faith, it's a personal commitment and choice for each one of us to make. And so it, it's often said in the Bible that, that Jesus said things to people. He said, your faith has healed you or your faith has saved you, or your faith has made you well. It was this response to him that often brought on these miracles. And so your response to God matters. It matters greatly. And what that looks like for you, what your response is, that's what we figure out as we seek God, as we pursue God. We start to find out what that response looks like, whether it is stepping out in faith, whether it is just trusting God for something, that might look different for each of us, but I want to look really quick at how this, this affects us. Mark chapter 6, uh, 4 through 6, Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his, his own house. Now he could do no mighty work there except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he marveled because of their unbelief. Jesus had a desire to do work. He had a desire to do great things as he did everywhere. He had a desire to do mighty things in his town, his hometown actually. But the people missed out because of their unbelief. They missed out because they had an Im improper response to him. And so there's no doubt that he would have done mighty things there. But these people missed out because they weren't in step. They weren't aligned with seeing him Clearly, and I think the issue for these people was familiarity. They had a familiarity with Jesus. They, they knew of him. They grew up with him. They, they said things like, hey, isn't that the carpenter? Isn't that Mary and Joseph's boy? You know, we know his brothers and sisters. Like, we know this guy. And all of a sudden, where did he learn all this, they said? Where did he get this wisdom? They had this, this acquaintance with Jesus. They were acquainted with him. Not in a personal sense, but they knew too much of him where they treated him as ordinary. They treated Jesus as ordinary. And I think this is what happened. And, and this led to their doubt and to their unbelief. And this is a danger that we face in the church too. Especially for those of us who have been serving Jesus a long time. Especially for those of us who have known him and been a Christian and following this faith for a long time. I think that we could fall into this familiarity. This can be a problem, and what we need to ask ourselves as we set up this year is, have I become too familiar? Have I become too comfortable with the things of God? Have I gotten too cozy with like a religious practice or, or just behaviors or, or just church going or whatever it is? Uh, even just kind of this ritualistic thing, has it become routine for me? Have I started to treat the house of God and the word of God and the people of God and the spirit of God? Have I started to look at that as ordinary and routine? It's a good question for us to ask ourselves. And if we have, if we're honest and we say, you know, maybe I have, I think that maybe this could explain why some of us might not see the power of God moving in our lives. I think if this is the case, then maybe that's why some of us may feel dry and empty and burned out. And if we have, if you're going through a season of life where you feel like your walk with God is, is mediocre or just even boring, then I think that this might be the case. We may have become too familiar. It may have lost 
what it's supposed to have. And so this may be why you struggle to feel God's presence. It may be why you struggle to hear God's voice. It may be the reason why you find yourself in, in certain areas of sin. And maybe why you don't see miraculous things happening is because we may become familiar. And so what, what man, this is going to be the, the thrust of this morning is that we need to stir up and foster really this continuous longing, hunger, and thirsting for the things of God. That it wouldn't be something that becomes bland because it's not bland. This is the most vibrant, alive that you will ever feel is when you're engaging with, with the Spirit of God, the presence of God, the Word of God, the people of God in the way that God intended it. That's where true life happens. You will never feel life until you have that. You'll chase it. You'll chase wanting to feel alive. You'll chase wanting to have a feeling. And what you do is you'll find yourself going from pleasure to pleasure to pleasure and moments and peaks and spikes. But let me tell you, those peaks come and, and the drops are even further. And they'll get further and further every time until you realize that you were created to know Jesus. And that's where the only fulfillment comes from. So this year's theme, the, the leadership of the church has decided that, that we're... We're believing for increase. We're believing for growth, both depth, height, wide, all around in all ways, just growth, just more, more of God, all things God, just more. That's what we're believing for. And the starting point for us is his presence. That's the starting point. Completely. The starting place for everything in our lives is him. Not what we get from him. Not the benefits of him, but, but it's him. He's the prize and the goal. And so our personal relationship with Jesus, that's what everything else needs to come out of. He's the, he's the starting place. He's the bedrock. He's the foundation. That's, wh that's what we stand upon. So we, we don't do things to get, get to him, but we do things because of the place of knowing him. We don't act for approval, but in Christ for those of us who repent of our sins and put our trust in him, we are coming from approval, not to achieve approval. And so if, if you find yourself like, oh, I'm needing to, to do these things, these religious acts, or even just the proper things, or, or even just obedience, if you're doing that from a place where it's like, man, I'm trying to achieve something, you're, you're missing it. Because in Christ, we come from a place of approval, where we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so that needs to be an, an, the identifying point of who you are, is that I don't work for the approval. Jesus did the work. He applied his righteousness to me when I believe. And then now because of this belief that's in me, because of who he's made me to be, then I go and do because I love him. And I obey because I love him. And so this is the starting point. Our focus today is going to be on this foundation is dwelling in his presence to learn to dwell in his presence and to be with him. And I believe this is primary. This is first, first step for you. This is, this is the place to come back to every time if you feel like you're in these seasons, is you need to learn to dwell again, learn to abide in him, learn to love and enjoy his presence. And so if we miss this in 2023, it doesn't matter what else happens. It doesn't matter what else happens in your life. If you miss this aspect today, it won't matter. Jesus even said in John 17, 3, he says, This is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. Knowing him is everything, and everything comes out of that knowing. And so I want to, before we dive into Psalm uh, 84 together, I want to give you a little background on this. Uh, when we talk about having a proper response to God, there's so many examples in the Bible. One really cool one is this particular group of people. They're called the sons of Korah. We see them in the Old Testament. And who was this group of people? It was really a family. We read about them in the book of Numbers. So they were Levites from the, the family of Kohath. Levites were this group that was set apart to full-time service to God. Full time, that's what they did, was just attend to all things that, that God required of them. And the Kohathites, Kohathites were responsible for the care of the sanctuary and the tabernacle and everything that had to do with that. The Ark of the Covenant and the lampstand and, and all that, that was their, their ground. 
So Korah was the grandson of Koath. And in number 16, Korah grew bitter of the work that they had to do. It was, it was, it was menial, tedious work that they had to do. It was hard work. And he started to grow bitter, and he grew jealous of the position of, of Moses and of Aaron, who were the high priest. He, he started to envy their positions. And so Korah led this rebellion of 250 community leaders against Moses and Aaron, which, bad idea. That's God's authority that he placed. They rose up in rebellion, and in that rebellion, God judged. God judged these people. And the Bible says that the earth opened up and swallowed them and those who were with them. And so Korah, this rebellion, cost him his life and the life of so many others. And, and there's so many you know, messages to be preached out of that. And it's, it's a very sad picture. But, but I, what I want to show you is this. If we go 10 chapters later in Numbers 26, there's a census that's being taken of the, the tribe of Israel in Israel. And verses 9 through 11, it says, Dathan and Abiram are the same community leaders who conspired with Korah against Moses and Aaron, rebelling against the Lord. But the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed them with Korah, and fire devoured 250 of their followers. This served as a warning to the entire nation of Israel. However, the sons of Korah did not die that day. God could have wiped out the entire lineage of, the, of Korah, but he chose to spare them. He chose to have mercy on the sons of Korah. He still had a purpose and a plan for their lives. Eventually, the prophet Samuel would come from the line of Korah. And during the time of King David, they became people who were known for worship in the tabernacle. How ironic. These people who had seen and experienced the power, the justice, the judgment, the wrath, but also the mercy and the love of God became people of worship. They became people who dwelled in the tabernacle. And so the sons of Korah, they ended up writing 11 of the Psalms, including this one that we are going to read today. And I believe that the reason that the sons of Korah were spared and the reason that they ended up where they were was a response to what they saw from God. They saw his power. They saw what he was capable of. They saw the consequences of rebellion. And they also saw the result of those who feared God they saw the result of those who obeyed God, and they said, okay, if my choice is that or that, I think I'm going to go over here. And, I, you know, if that's the result of those who oppose him, I'm going to get as close as I possibly can. I'm not going to run. I, I run to, to God, and this is what they chose. They encountered him in these ways, and they chose to be obedient. And so we see this longing that they have. And if you read, I think they wrote Psalms 42 through 49, and then 84 through 86, and then I think 88 and 89. If you read some of these Psalms, you'll see the desperation of these people. They know they need God. Psalm 42 says, As the deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants for the living God. Just, I mean, just deep, deep desire. And Psalm 84, it calls us to a greater and a deeper longing for God's house. And so in Psalm 84, in that time with these people, uh, the presence of God had dwelt in the tabernacle, or that, that was referred to as God's house. And so a love for God's house really meant a love for God's presence. And, and before we, we dive in, this psalm, it really rebukes. It's kind of a rebuke and then also a picture and also a, a calling to us. Um, and it really opposes any kind of shallow, meager spirituality that we might fall into. We fall into this kind of just shallow, kind of meaningless, you know, procedural, routine type of spirituality, this, this will be drastically contrasted to anything like that. And so it kind of rebukes and denies any form of familiarity and casualty that we feel towards the house of God, towards God himself, and all these things. It, it, it drives us to this longer, this longing that we should have for him. And I hope that, that as I read this, even in, in the place that I am, I, when I read through and I was studying this, I literally got done reading it, and I said to myself, I said, man, i got to stop playing games. i got to stop playing games with God. 
because if this is the standard, this is a picture of what my life should look like, this is the picture of what my heart should desire, I, 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 need, to, I need to get to a different place. And so I hope that stirs that for you this morning. Charles Spurgeon, he referred to this psalm as the pearl of psalms. He says, if the 23rd is the most popular, if the 103rd is the most joyful, the 119th is the most deeply experiential, and the 51st is the most sorrowful, then this is one of the sweetest of the psalms. Psalm 84. So I pray that this would just inspire you and stir up a hunger in your hearts this morning for God. I just want to pray before we jump in. Father, we thank you for your presence that abides in us and with us and that's just manifested here this morning. I pray that we would just be completely opened up to you. God, that we would open, just peel back our hearts, open up our spirits so that you might just pour into us, Lord, that you might um, just fill us with your spirit, fill us with your word in a fresh new way this morning and just change us. God, just miraculously transform us this morning. Let this not just be a routine thing for us. Let it not be a, oh, let's, let's just get it, let's get this in and, and, and get home and get ready for the Vikings game or whatever. No, nothing else matters, God. I pray that this would be a deeply transformational, experiential time with you and that you would just have your way, that you work in us and that you'd be glorified in everything. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so if it's all right with you, I'm just going to read through this first. It'll take about 90 seconds, and then we're going to go back, and I just want to work through this a little bit. So Psalm 84, and then we're, going to, we're just going to read the whole chapter. It's so 12 verses. It says, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts! For my soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home, the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. Even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will be still praising you. Blessed is the man whose strength is in you, whose heart is set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. Each one appears before God in Zion. O Lord, God of hosts, hear my prayer. Give ear, O God of Jacob. O God, behold our shield. O look upon the face of your anointed, for a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. So powerful. And I just want, I want to walk back through, and I pray as we do, I pray as we do, that your spiritual eyes and ears would be opened to receive what God, whatever God wants you to see this morning, whatever Holy Spirit leads to just burn into your heart, that it would be. Verse 1 says, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. I mean, you can just hear the language already. How lovely, how beautiful. There's just this deep affection already starting off for your tabernacle or for the temple or for the dwelling place of God. It's a beautiful thing. And this is everything that's associated with but for us now, talking about the church, but also talking about his presence. To long for the tabernacle in those days, as I said, that's where the presence of God was. So to long for the tabernacle was to long for God's presence. It was to say how beautiful, how lovely is your dwelling place where you are. Most importantly, his presence, but also the safety that comes in it. The house of God, the safety and the beauty that comes with the gathering, like what we're doing right now, this is part of what he's talking about, the beauty and how lovely it is for us to gather like this. Verse 2, it gets even deeper. He says, my soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. My soul longs and even faints. So deep. I mean, such a, such a longing and desire. One commentator said, not every love is so great to make a longing. 
and not every longing is so great to make a fainting. This, this is level upon level of depth of desire and love for God. And I wonder, is there any one of us who could say that about anything in our lives? I, there's probably not too many people that would long to the point of fainting for something in general. I think the only time I think of fainting is when, when people have something that's crucial to their survival. Whether that be water or electrolytes or nourishment or food to bring your blood sugar up. Most of the time when I think of fainting, I think of catastrophic f- feelings. And so, so the picture here that, that we can see is that it's like, man, this is crucial to life itself. Is, is God's presence. It's God's house. And that's so true for us. And he says, my heart and my flesh cry out. Heart being the inward parts of us. Flesh being the outward parts of us. From the inside out, there's this longing and desire. And cry out. When it says to cry out here, it means that it's, it's something that's not just joy, but it's actually a desperation. It's a loud cry of desperation for God. And I think for some of us, there needs to be a loosening of our vocal cords. There needs to be a loosening, whether it starts in the spirit or what. But we need to get to the place again where we cr- we're able to cry out to God. Where there's something that stirs up within you. Man, I think about, you know, I got, I got a, a baby girl that'll be a year in f- six days. Like, when she gets excited, like, you better have something <laughs> plug in your ears. Because there's going to be ruptures. There's going to be windows breaking. Like, it just, she can't help but just boil out, you know. And I think as we grow up, whether it's through just like the scars of life or traumas or whatever we deal with, things just start to get closed in. They get closed over. And like, God calls us to have this childlike faith where it's like, we just act like a child with him. In the way that it's like, man, when a kid gets excited, like, did you ever seen that? Just they're like gritting their teeth and they want to hit something usually or... You know, and they just scream like that. That's what I picture with God. It's like, man, I just I long for him in the way that it's like, man, I just cry out to him. It's just a response you can't contain. And this language, it just provides this evidence that this this the psalmist just has this deep longing and appetite for God. Just a craving and a hunger for this is a key. The living God, my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. And this is what church is about. It's primarily about him. His presence, not programs, not social connections or interactions, not not anything about self-improvement or entertainment. It's about him. He's the center. Like we might as well take all of us and get rid of these chairs and and circle up and, and just imagine like we're focused on him. He's the middle of it all. Even for me right now, as I'm, I'm up here preaching, he is at the center of everything. For me, for you, he is all in all. He's, he's completely supreme. He's the priority. First above all is him. And, and that's what we need to foster is, is this holy hunger, this divine hunger, this spiritual thirst that's only quenched by him. And what, what people don't know is they're pursuing that. They have that thirst. They have that hunger. The Bible says that eternity has been written on the heart of every man and woman. You desire the eternal. You desire God. And they search everywhere, high and low, to find it. But it's only found in Him. This hunger is what we need. Verse 3, it says, Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young, even at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. I love as I studied this, I love this picture of what we see with these birds. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself. The sparrow is considered a bird of small significance, little significance, kind of a meaningless bird. And then the swallow is a picture of restlessness as swallows just kind of constantly are floating around and, and floating around. It's a picture of restlessness. And what's beauty is that they found a home in the house of God. And so those who feel like they're of little significance or little meaning, they can find significance in the Lord. And for those who find themselves as, a, maybe you feel like a picture of restlessness, where you're, you have no peace, you have no stillness, you can find a home in the house of God. You can find a home in the presence of God. 
a place to make a nest. You can find peace. You can find rest in the Lord. And that's what this is pointing towards, the sparrow, the swallow. And I think about how Matthew 6 even talks about this. He cares for the birds of the air. How much more important are you? And so the fact that even the, the birds are invited in to find a place in the house of God, you need to know that there is a place of belonging for you in the house of God, in the presence of God, among the people of God. There's significance for your life. There's rest that's available to you. Commentator said this, it says, it is evidently the design of this passage to intimate us, to bring us to intimacy, that in the house and at the altar of God, a faithful soul can find freedom from care and sorrow, quietness of mind, and gladness of spirit, like a bird that has secured a little mansion for the reception and education of her young. This is a key to the whole thing this morning. Do you want to know what's the wisest and most crucial thing that you can do in 2023? Become a people of the presence. Become a people of the presence. Become someone who pursues and dwells in the presence of God. Someone who makes a home, who builds a nest, who plants themselves in the presence of God and in the house of God and among the people of God. We need to become a people of the presence who are not just about it as, a oh, it's something I want or maybe something I can add. But no, it's something that I desire and that I need and that I require is the presence of God. Yeah. That I cannot go without it. That I am destroyed without it. And as Jesus said, we can't do anything without it. He said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So abide in me and I will abide in you. These promises are just, if you look for them, if you seek them, they will pour off the pages and drench you. But it takes the response. You must have this desire to pursue him. And he makes this promise. Jeremiah 29, 13, he says, if you seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. You will find me. James says that, that you draw near unto God, he will draw near unto you. It's a promise. It's a fact. Take it to the bank every time. But it does take an initiation on our part. It says, even your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. The altar was the innermost part, the innermost place was the altar, the safest place, the closest place. And this is pointing towards the safety that comes in his presence. There's a safety in his presence. When we sit at his altar, when we kneel at his altar, there's safety, there's security. And the altar is it's also a place of surrender. It's a place of surrender. It's a place of sacrifice where we lay down, we sacrifice, the things in our lives. It's almost like this exchange. God, I'm going to lay down. I'm going to exchange anything else. I'm going to lay it down on the altar and I'm going to receive your presence. Really, really awesome, awesome picture. Verse 4 says, Blessed are those who dwell in your house. A simple and profound promise. Those who dwell in the house of God, those who dwell in the presence of God are blessed. Simple. It's so, so much of this is so simple. Dwell in God's presence, you'll be blessed. Dwell in his presence, you're blessed. To dwell, it means to sit down. It means to remain. To sit down and to remain. And that this, is, uh, this is what I believe with every part of me, that this is what God's looking for. He's looking for people that will dwell. He's looking for people that will remain in him, that will remain in his presence, that will be content to sit down, to camp out, to remain, to stay, to not be easily distracted, to not be easily strayed away, to not be easily pulled away from him or, or pulled by distractions and desires, but that they will say, this is, this is where I'm making my home. This is where I'm making my nest is in the presence 
I'm going to be a person of the presence. And in that, there is blessing. I don't, I'm not going to hurry. I don't want an agenda. It's you, God. You're all I want. Verse 5 brings us even to more blessing. It says, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you and whose heart is set on pilgrimage. More blessing. The one who finds their strength in, in what? In God will be blessed. Not in money, not in power, not in materialistic things, not in pleasures, not in people, not in yourself. The one who finds their strength in God is the one who will be blessed. And whose heart is set on pilgrimage. This is a picture of, of pilgrimage, of, of traveling. In, in the times back then, the Jews had to travel, I think, three times a year to Jerusalem, to, to, to where the tabernacle, the temple was, the presence of God. Luckily for us now, I'm skipping to the end to give you the good part, I guess. I feel the Spirit leading. What's beautiful is that we don't have to traverse over mountain ranges and valleys and forests and treacherous things to be in the presence of God. Jesus brought the presence of God here. He no longer dwells in the tabernacle, but for us in the New Covenant, in the New Testament, the tabernacle is you. It's you. We are the abiding dwelling place of God. And that's transformational. You don't got to run and seek. He's come to make a home in you, in your heart. But pilgrimage is still this idea that you are going to still, whatever the, the conditions are going to be in your life, you're going you're gonna to traverse the conditions, the journey, whatever you're on, that you are set on presence. You are set on him and his presence, committed to pursuing him. And man, this, I love this. I, man, I love the Bible. Oh, I love the Bible. And man, if, if, you are, if you're not abiding, if you're not taking the time to, to get deep, you miss, man, you will miss so much. Because God wants to reveal layer by layer and depths. He wants you to plumb depths that can never like, be reached. He's a never-ending well. And there's so many cool things. You see, verse 6, it says, As they pass through... The valley of Bacchus. So they, meaning the ones who find their strength in God and, and their hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a spring. The rain also covers it with pools. This is what's so cool. The, the Hebrew word Baca is to weep. And so what we see here is this. It says that when the Lord is your strength, when your heart is set on him and his, his presence... That even though you pass through the valley of weeping, even though you pass through the valley of tears, even though you pass through the pit of despair or whatever struggles that you encounter, it says it will be made into a spring. What does that mean? You will, there will be refreshment in that place. Even when you pass through a waterless, lifeless place, God will make that into a place of rich abundance and blessing. He will make it into a place where you will be thirst, your thirst to be quenched. And this is the promise that comes with those who trust in God, for those who find their strength in Him, is that no matter what journey you find yourself on, no matter what valley you endure, I think of Psalm 23, right? It says, even though I, I, I pass through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because you are with me. That's the presence of God. It's the power of God and the promise of God is that no matter what you go through, even in hardship, you can find richness in him. You can find increase and even blessing. When everyone's looking around you and saying, I know what's going on in your life. I, I know the stuff that you're going through. I've seen the pain that you're in. I've seen the destruction. I've seen the calamities and trials and stuff. And they, yet they see you flourishing. They see you like this tree that's just robust and bearing fruit. And they're like, man, that does not make sense to my human mind. Why is it that you're going through things that are just brutal, even torturous, right? Trial after trial. But yet here you are and it's like you're just flourishing. It's like, man, it's because I find my strength in him. It's because I am set on pilgrimage. I am set and I am abiding and I dwell in the presence of God. Where blessing is where strength is, where comfort is, 
where peace and joy and hope and life abide is in his presence. Verse 7, it says that these people will go from strength to strength. Usually on a journey, when you travel, especially over long distances, even in the car it gets this way, but especially these people going on foot through mountain ranges and stuff. Typically when you travel, you go from strength to fatigue, strength to weakness. This is where God supernaturally overcomes the physical. Because for these people who find their strength in God, you go from strength to strength. It's ever increasing strength because it's from him. So for those in Christ, their strength, a rich relationship with God is a never-ending, ever-increasing strength that will abide in you as you abide in him. For any journey, for any difficult season that you go through, he's with you, strength to strength. And it says that they will appear before God in Zion, the loving and the longing and the heart set on pilgrimage. It will bring you to his presence. It will assure this. In verse 10, shows us that there's really just nothing better. It says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. The most lowly, humble, meek positions in the house of God, being a doorkeeper, it's like, man, that is better and being in God's presence than to ascend to the throne of any type of wickedness to dwell in any type of tent of wickedness, to be in the presence of God, even doing the most menial thing, is far more valuable. And you know what? I would take being a doorkeeper, and I'll tell you why. i tell you why I think being a doorkeeper is one of the most blessed things you can be. What is a doorkeeper? First in, first out, or last out. First in, last out. That's what I want to be. I'll be the first in the presence and I'll be the last out of the presence. That's what I want. I'll be a doorkeeper. I'll, I'll hold the door. Also, what's cool about a doorkeeper, what do they do? They help make a place for people. They open the door, and that's where you get to be. As you learn to dwell in God's presence, as you learn to abide in him, you get to be the type of person that opens that door for other people to dwell with him. Even in the fact that we talked about, we are the abiding tabernacle of God. He lives in you. If you believe and trust in Christ, he lives in you. So what does that make you? You're a carrier of his presence. And so whenever, when you leave this place and you go to wherever you're going to, guess what's coming with you? Whoever you get to encounter with, they got no choice but to have the spirit of God coming with. Like you get to be, like you open the door. A friend of mine gave me this really awesome picture, and it's what I strive to be. And this is what I pray that I'm actually doing this morning. Is that our goal in life is to, to sit at the table with Jesus, to abide and dwell with him, but then to also be a people who we pull up a chair and we show people to their chair. So we, we pull, pull up a chair for people to have them meet with Jesus whether it's for the first time in our sharing and proclaiming the gospel and telling them how they can have a relationship with him forever, or in the way that we spur one another on to love and good works like Hebrews 10 tells us to do, but just be people who we abide in the presence and we're so saturated in the presence and in the love and in the word of God that it's like everywhere we go, it's like if I bump up against you, oh, whoops, sorry, you're soaked. Like, they can't help but be like, well, what is on me? You know, like, we just carriers. Just be carriers. But it's because we've been with him. There's no comparison to him. I'd rather be a doorkeeper. Verse 11, it says, For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. A sun, it equals blessing, and a shield equals defense. He is our blessing and our defense. The sun, what does it do? It brings light. It brings clarity. It brings the brightness to our day. It is illuminating. It's enlightening. It brings joy. It brings warmth. It brings clarity of vision. And this is what the, Jesus is the source of all this. Even in Revelation, it says that in heaven, there's no need for a sun because he illuminates everything. 
He's the light that bursts out of him. He's the warmth, the joy that comes directly from him. He is our sun, our blessing, our shield. He is our strength. He is our protection. He is our provider. He is our defender. He's a fortress. No matter what we go through, he is our light that, that lights our path. And he's also our shield that defends us against anything, any calamity that might come our way on that journey. He's our sun and our shield. And Psalm 27 one says, The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? Psalm 56.13 says, For you have rescued me from death, you have kept my feet from slipping, so now I can walk in your presence, O God, in your life-giving light. It says, The Lord will give grace and glory, and no good thing will he withhold from those who walk uprightly. From those who walk uprightly. Those who walk uprightly both in lifestyle and in motive. God cares about the condition of your heart. He cares about where your heart is, what your desire is, what your intentions are. He sees through that. You can fool people. You can fool yourself. I've tricked myself into thinking like, oh yeah, I'm in a good place. And immediately God will cut through and say, I see what your intentions are. I see what you really are trying to do there. He says, I want your heart. That's what I want. And once I have your heart, you don't got to worry about what's going to happen. You, you, you will obey from the place of, of understanding what it means. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And so it's this reciprocal thing where out of love for him, it initiates us to do what is obedient because we know that when we're not obedient, that brings us into a place that hinders our relationship with him. It hinders our dwelling with him. And so when we obey, we realize that brings us back to loving him. And when we love him, it brings us back to obeying him. And it's this continual cycle as we pursue him. And he said, for those who do right, I will withhold no good thing. And what a promise that is. And this is affirmed later in Romans 8, 28. It says, for he works all things out to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Those who love him will obey him. And those who obey him have been promised that, that there will be nothing that is good for you that will be withheld. Beautiful promise. And ending here in verse 12, there's a blessing as well. It says, O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man who trusts in you. There's a prerequisite for blessing. It's trust. To trust in him is what assures the blessing. To believe in him, to have faith in him is what assures this promise. And notice it's not your good deeds. It's not your achievements. It's not how much. Because man, we can get into this competitive mindset where we're like, oh, okay, so the goal is to dwell. Well, I'm gonna dwell the most. I'm gonna dwell more than anyone else. And you're gonna see like, oh, he's doing four hours a day, I'll do five. God doesn't care about your achievements. He doesn't care about the religious things that you do trying to earn. He wants you to dwell because you desire him, because you trust in him. It's because of what he's done. As I said before, Jesus did all the work in the form of we are now in the place where if we repent and trust in Jesus, what's left for us is to abide. And then out of that blows everything else. You, you'll do good you will be moved. I'll tell you what, if you, if you abide and dwell and you catch fire, you, you cannot help but do the things that God desires you to do. As he shows you, as you read his word and you start to find out, oh, this is what someone who loves Jesus really does. I want to be that. Why? Because I love him. Nothing else matters to me. And so our, our believing for awesome things this year, incredible things 
And I'm not just saying that. If you know me at all, I'm not a just say things kind of dude. I'm not just saying it. I believe that God's got him powerful, amazing, awesome things that he wants you to step into. And also us as a people, as a community, as a family, Stonebridge Church, but it's going to hinge on our response. It really is going to hinge and the starting place must be him. The starting place for us has got to be him. Pursuing, dwelling, remaining in his presence. And if he's the aiming point, we're not going to lack any good thing that he had for us. Psalm 16, 8, it says, You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 92, it says, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bear fruit in old age, and they shall be fresh and flourishing. Could probably even add that to our goals for this year. I want to be fresh and flourishing. I want to, I want to bear fruit. I want to know him. I want to love him. I want to be more like Jesus each day this year. And I want to see what happens in our lives if we commit to that. I'm, I'm excited to see that for each one of us. If we make this decision, and what, what more could we want than these promises? Just, so just as we're believing for these things, it hinges on his presence. Being people of the presence. Becoming a people who dwell. Becoming a people who abide. Becoming people who we cancel other plans because we need to be with him. We, we clear things off our schedule because we need to be with him. We clear things off the schedule because they're like, you know what, I got to go to the house of God. I got to be with his people. I got to be built up. I got to encourage somebody. Man, how cool would that be? A lot of times we come into church and we're like, man, I need to be lifted up. What if, you, what if you were so full from your time with God throughout the week that you came in and you're like, I could not come because I, I need to give this to somebody. You know, I got a word for somebody. I got something bubbling up in me. So there's a fire that's just burning in me and I got to share it with somebody. Man, I, I can't wait to get to the house of, yeah, I worship in my car, I worship at home, but man, there's nothing like being with the people in his presence, manifest presence, praising him. Nothing like it. Man, I just want to hunger for that. I just want to thirst for that. I want that to be everything. This is what we must be given to this year. The joy of him. The joy of dwelling. The joy of abiding. Let me tell you, you can, you can, things you've been chasing, things you've been running from, you can resolve all that. And it's, it's in his presence. It's in seeking him. I'll tell you right now, you don't, you don't have to have a 10 step plan. You don't have to, to, to go to some seminar conference, self-improvement, whatever. The answer you need, they're found in his presence and they're found in his word. There's a reason why it says, seek me with your whole heart. You will find me. It's a promise. He's waiting. He's waiting. So I just want to end with this psalm. May it just be the, the prayer of our heart today. The psalm is 27, verse 4. It says, one thing have I desired of the Lord. One thing. This is the one thing this year. If there's anything else you pursue, this is the one thing. One thing I've desired of the Lord, that alone will I seek, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle. He shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me. Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Let's stand.
There is life, there is light, there is joy, there is hope, there is peace, there's meaning, there's purpose, there's healing, there's restoration and reconciliation. There's blessing that's found in his presence. And listen, if you, if you don't know him, if you're, I don't know everyone here, if there's a, there's a position that you're in where, where you don't know if you have a relationship with Jesus, it doesn't have to be complicated, okay? I described it earlier. It's really as simple as this. It's a fact that every one of us were in the same place, sinners, broken, in need of a Savior. Every one of us, even playing field, all needed him, not able to bring ourselves out of our sin. No amount of good works or faith and trust in ourselves would do it. It had to be blood sacrifice that covers sin. God had to bring justice for, for wrongdoing and for sin, and he did it in Jesus. He sent his son to die for each one of us, live perfectly, to bear your sin on the cross, to shed his blood as payment. Unbelievable exchange that takes place when we come to trust in him by faith that he gives us his righteousness. He took our sin and our death and now he's offering to us his righteousness and his peace and his hope and his life forever. And what he requires is us is that we repent of our sins, change our minds, turn away from our wickedness and to turn our face towards Jesus, to submit and surrender to him forever, to offer our lives, to lay them down for him. And in return, we're given life, true life. The Bible says the one who hangs on to their lives will lose it, but the one who gives their life up will find it. We find life in him. And so for the only way that you can enter into a relationship with him is to believe and trust in him. And if you do that, he will make you new, completely new, not upgraded, not, not into a better person. He'll make you a new person, brand new person. The Bible says old things pass away, all things become new. We are a new creation in Christ. So you can lay down who you were before and pick up a beautiful new identity that's called a child of God, forgiven. And so if you want to do that this morning, that's just what you got to do. Just believe it in your heart. Believe it in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's born of a virgin, died on the cross, raised three days later, and now he is king in heaven. Surrender, submit your life, and he'll fill you with his spirit. And I promise you, you'll be changed forever, transformed forever. And that starts you on a journey of continuously pursuing him, dwelling with him. So I pray that as, as we go about, man, even starting now, that maybe you get out in your car and you're like, man, I can't even put my car in drive because I need to just be with him. But that we be people of the presence. And if you don't know how, this is a great place to find out. Stonebridge Church, we're committed to helping people know Jesus, to find their purpose, to find healing, to find restoration, and to know him more and more. And then we're committed to bringing it to everyone that we encounter in this world. Let's pray. Father, we're just grateful for your presence. Lord, I pray that you just continually just give us a holy hunger, just a divine desire for you. God, for those whose, whose appetites seem to be more for the things of this world, for those who have an appetite, Lord, where, where maybe the things of God feel bland, Lord, where you just right now just, just hit them. Lord, let your spirit come upon them. Lord, you give them a desire for your presence. You give them a desire for your word. Lord, that you give them a love for you that just burns like a raging inferno. God, will you help us to dwell? Teach us to dwell. God, help us to eliminate every distraction. Help us to lay down every care and concern and anxiety and, and the go, go, go and the hustle and the grind. God, it's th that opposes the dwelling with you. God, you provide for us everything we need. 
You have a promise that you give good things to those who love you and who are, who are called to your purposes. So God, may we be people of the presence. May we be people of your purposes. Lord, may we, may we not be deceived by the enemy to start pursuing anything else but you. And that as we seek, your word says that we seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, that all things will be given to us. All that we need will be provided and supplied as we pursue you. Because you're good and you have no limits. You own all things. Everything on this earth is yours. And you can do miraculous things in our lives, God, but it comes through our faith and our trusting in you, God. So will you help us just to love you more? Will you help us just to pursue Jesus and to become like him? Lord, I, I pray that we would just continually crave your presence, crave your word, and that, that through that, God, we will see you work in mighty ways in this year. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we thank you. Be with us this day. May we always be aware of your presence and may we leave this place saying that, that I know my identity in Christ and I know that everywhere I go, I carry the presence of God with me and that God has a purpose for me in everything I do. We love you and we, and we just surrender to you completely. We praise your holy name, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week as you dwell.